another Zoom panel discussion. What do we hope to achieve with these events? It is not unknown to all of us that there is a tremendous rise in attacks against the Asian, American, and Pacific Islander community, not only in New York City, but nationwide. The situation has become vicious as it has become an almost daily occurrence. The community's response was outrage, protests, and marches, but it also has had a debilitating effect because of fear our people are afraid of venturing outside their homes. So, what do we hope to take away from our conversation this evening? I'm hoping that we will have a better sense of what is happening and that our fear will be lessened as we realize that we are not alone and that we can act together in finding solutions to this issue. Tonight, we are united as one AAPI community, and along with our allies, we are addressing this issue. We are also addressing our elected officials and authorities that we will not settle for less. No more grandstanding, no more empty promises, and no more endless investigations. We want concrete response from you. This evening, the AAPI community and our allies are here to learn, to support one another, and to act together to build a safer New York City that welcomes all people and all ethnicities. Now I'd like to introduce Noel Quintana, whom you may know as a survivor of an anti-Asian attack. He is also an important member of the Migrant Center of New York. Having volunteered with us since 2017, lending his accounting skills to help our nonprofit grow. He will share a little about what he went through on the day of his attack and why it's important for us to come together to talk about the attacks on our community. Noel? Thank everyone. I'm Noel Quintana and I, I, I'm a, um, an admin assistant uh, in a non-profit -organ uh, non organization that dealt with a uh, mental problem um, in Harlem. So um, on February 3rd, um, about eight o'clock in the morning, uh, my usual my usual uh, routine is going to the going to the going to the facility, going to the office. So I boarded the L train, and in inside the L train, uh, there's a lot of people standing standing room only so uh, I stood on the uh, on the um, entrance and on the other side so that I would not be a, uh, a hindrance from uh, people coming in and co going out of the train so uh, when I reached Bedford uh, a man came and stood by my uh, and stood by uh, by my side and in a few minutes, he started kicking my uh, bag, my tote bag. So um, I turned, uh, I turned on his back or on my back, so that and I put my uh, my bag in front of me, so that in case that uh, my bag is um, uh, disturbing him, uh, it wouldn't be so. But in a few more minutes, he kicked again, and that's the time where the uh, the train stopped on the next uh, station, which is the uh, uh, First Avenue, 14th, uh, 14th Street, and I moved towards the um, towards the uh, inside 
I moved inside the train and I said to him, what's wrong with you? And that's the time where um, he, sh he slashed my face. And then it's also uh, uh, the time where the uh, door opened. So she, uh, he exited, uh, he exited the train um, right away and, um, and fled. And when I realized that I was slashed, I thought I was punched, but I didn't feel anything. But uh, when I saw the reaction from the crowd, and I saw um, from um, from the man's hand that he was holding a uh, back scatter, I realized that I was slashed, and I uh, and I put my hands on my face, and I I felt blood oozing. So I asked for help and uh, nobody helped me inside the train, though uh, though there are a lot of people there. There were a lot of people there and um, nobody helped me. So uh, when I realized that nobody was helping me, so that's then I decided to go out and seek help outside. And um, I walk from uh, from end to end of the station because uh, there's nobody there, so I had to go to the to the pro, uh, to the front in, uh, and look for a booth because I knew that there's somebody would there in the booth, and I asked the lady there to uh, to help me and call nine one one, and she was shocked too, but. Uh, she did call nine one and the uh, and the uh, police came, and a few more minutes, um, the medic came and they asked me if I could uh, still walk. I said yes, and I did walk. But in the middle towards the ambulance, I felt dizzy. So that's the time where uh, they put they uh, put me the stretcher and they uh drove me to Bellevue Hospital where they are uh, repaired my uh, the, the, my face, the slashed, the slashes. But um, the blood was still oozing and it didn't stop. So um, they asked me if uh, they want me to work. Uh, be operating the operating room so they could see air uh, and um, and clean my face, which I agreed. And um, the operation took about uh, three hours just to uh, do uh, to do some stitches in my face and. Um, I felt um, I felt alone, and I felt so um, so scared when nobody even helped me because I thought that I would die um, because of the blood, because of uh, blood oozing, and I thought that most of the fatalities or accidents. Uh, were due to blood, uh, loss of blood. So I think that um, it is important that um, a bystander at least, or any or everybody that should know how to respond to a uh, a crisis like this. Uh, nobody even uh, vegetate what happened. Because I haven't, um, I did not uh, see any videos regarding uh, that incident. Nobody even uh, um, called the uh, train operator just to inform that somebody was uh, hurt inside the train. And uh, they just They just look at me and uh, as if nothing happened. They were shocked, yes, but uh, they didn't do anything. I think 
that uh, people should be responsive and um, know what to do, at least vegetate, so that uh, if a uh, police would ask for more evidence they could show or uh, being, uh, we, we are being ignored because we are because of our silence we don't uh, we don't complain uh, we just kept it to ourselves on what happened and um, I think um, Asians should uh, solidify and um, fight for this injustice being perpetrated almost every day. Thank you. No, thank you so much for your courage always in uh, sharing your story and encouraging every other people in the community to speak up um, and for reminding us how important it is um, that we do have a voice and we do give our voice to this so that our community can get the support that it needs. Um, I forgot, I realized I didn't introduce myself in the beginning, by the way. I'm Juhan, I'm the Deputy Director of the Asian American Federation. While most people here probably understand pieces of the history that got us here, let's just spend the first question getting everybody on the same page on the history of Asian Americans in this country and what might have led up to this moment. We're first going to start with Kevin to get a historical context. The Asian American Federation for having me here today. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that's so important for us to recognize is that while there definitely has been an uptake um, in anti-Asian hate uh, this past year as a result of uh, the pandemic and some of the anti-Asian rhetoric uh, that may have been spewed um, since uh, 2020, um, we have to understand that this is something that has been part of the history of what is now known as the United States. Um, when the first Chinese people first started to arrive in the 1800s, um, there were laws that were created as a way of uh, discriminating against them and even um, keeping them out of this country. Uh, the first immigration law to specifically target uh, people outside of the United States from coming and from certain groups from coming to the United States was targeted towards uh, Chinese women in uh, 1875, the Page Act, followed by the uh, Asian Exclusion Act, uh, also known as the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, with later iterations in, in 1924 as well. Um, and so when we think about the history of Asian Americans in this country, we have to acknowledge that uh, immigration laws were created to keep us out. Um, that prior to then, you know, there were no such things as federal federal immigration laws uh, to try to keep Asian Americans in. Um, Asian Americans at that time, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Filipino Americans, um, were viewed as uh, as people who were stealing jobs and stealing women, and were viewed as uh, sexualized um, criminals um, and. Uh, part of that was because the majority of the people that came during that time uh, were men. Um, and so uh, we see that there was a lot of anti-Asian violence. Uh, there was a massacre that uh, killed hundreds of Chinese people. There was uh, Watsonville riots in 1930 um, in which Filipino people were targeted. Um, we also have seen uh, the Japanese internment during World War II. Um, and, you know, even with Vincent Chin in 1970, as well as uh, the what's happened in the past 20 years with 9-11 um, that uh, Asian people, South Asian people, Muslim people have been targeted as a result of anti-Asian violence. Um, and that's something um, that doesn't get talked about. So anti-Asian hate has definitely increased these past 20 years um, or these, this past year, but it has been around um, for 20 years um, and even before that. Um, and that's something that uh, I hope we recognize as part of our history because it's oftentimes not taught in the classroom and isn't known by most Americans. Thank you, Kevin. The more that we educate our young people, the more that we're working on prevention, right? And I think it's also worth mentioning that I grew up in Florida. And so the kind of education that I had around American history and just slavery um, and then the genocide of indigenous people it was, it was so whitewashed, right? Like there, there's still so much whitewashing of American history that is being taught all across America. About how, how long it would take if we started including education, uh, Asian American studies in K through 12 or at the college level, how long do you think that would take for it to 
for us to see any sort of tangible benefit from it. And then if, if you see anything else, any action that individuals or companies or schools should be taking. Yes, thank you so much. I think um, on the question of how long would it take, I think right away. Culture is such a powerful mover of how we act, right? If you think about how long did it take for the last administration to say anti-Asian things and then create a stir? How long did it take for, for music to have an impact on consent, right? Culture, how we teach each other, like that, that impact is right away. People start questioning, thinking, re-challenging themselves, especially young people right away. I know so many times I've been on the train and something happened to me and the first people that did something were young people. Um, it's been a really great conversation. Um, I really appreciate everyone who stuck through with us. I think in the conversation in the chat we saw, definitely there's a range of opinions, but I think the healthy discussion that we're having all comes from a place of wanting safety for our community members, for our loved ones. So I really appreciate everyone staying engaged with us. You can support Noel on his road to healing and recovery by donating to his validated GoFundMe page. Um, is that the link right there where someone could drop in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, learn more about uh, the Asian American Federation's Hope Against um, Hate campaign. Someone asked about it in the chat um, of where that 30 million is going to go to. Joanne talked a little bit about it, but you can definitely learn more on our website, um, aafederation.org. It's going to help us put immediate street safety solutions in place. You can donate to our campaign, and so which is a link that's also in our website. And please follow us on social media to keep up to date on that aspect of our work.